Thank you. Okay. Um, so next, I'd like to briefly set the stage for tonight's presentation with a look back at what happened today 119 years ago. And then I'll give up my seat to Jason and I guess we're on camera and I'll go full screen to share my screen. In fact, I'm screen sharing and I'm going to move this and I'll go into the slide view mode. And this went into that funky view, but uh, are you seeing a... It looks good there. Okay, good. I'm not recording that, but it looks good. There. Okay, go ahead and start recording. <laughs> Monday, January 11th, 1904, the opening of the fair was three and a half months away. The gigantic palaces were largely up and being finished, but Festival Hall, the Cascades, the Pike, and many other structures still had a long ways to go. Construction on the Ferris wheel was just getting started. Would it all be ready for opening day? No. The Ferris wheel opened about four weeks after the fair opened, May 28th and many pike concessions, about almost half of them, didn't open until sometime in May. So opening day, the palaces, most of the exhibits, and about half of the pike were open. Uh, but they still had a tremendous amount of people that came out to opening day. I think it was 293,000 or something like that. I think that's in your show. No, that, that that's that not. not I didn't talk about that. Before. Okay. Newspaper reported that St. Louis schools were being allocated 4,600 square feet in the Palace of Education. Each day, a different St. Louis school would send a class to the fair for their lessons, and fair visitors could observe their techniques in their class. After the fair, Superintendent Louis Soldan convinced the school board to purchase pictures of the fair for a school museum. And that became the first audiovisual program of St. Louis schools. And finally, uh, seems every time there's at least something you can kind of chuckle at. J.S. Hooks of Dublin, Georgia, notified fair officials that he had engaged Laughing Ben Illington to come to the fair. His letter to David R. Francis said, this famous old Negro of the South had made a name for himself as the greatest laughing person in the world at several expositions across the US. He would be exhibited on the pike. However, fair officials wanted to avoid the sideshow spectacles typical at county fairs and keep the fair's exhibits respectable. So this was one of many proposals for exhibits that was turned down. Uh, and now let's move on to our presentation. I do want to uh, tell people, well, I want to tell people, if you haven't filled out a little piece of paper and put your name in that box back there for a drawing, we are going to be giving away one of these books. This is a printed version of a hundred and some odd page journal, 108 page journal, handwritten by Laura Merritt, who came to the World's Fair for two weeks with her family in late August and September 1904. And it is a fantastic read, uh, really worthwhile. And we just got it before the banquet. We're selling it online. We can take your orders. And uh, if you fill out your name, phone number, and uh, maybe last four of your credit card, we can get in touch tomorrow and you can pay for it. But you can probably take it home tonight. We're not allowed to sell here. So we're going to do a two-part sell, deliver it, and then sell. And I'll track you down. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I'll talk about upcoming meetings afterwards, but do stay around for the attendance prize. We will be giving away one of these to one of the 35, 40 people in the room. Not sure if anybody's counted yet. About 60. About 60? Wow. Plus 20 out online. That's over 80 people. Biggest crowd we've had in a long time. Okay, I'll talk about upcoming uh, meetings and events, but first, next, I'll talk about Jason Stratman. He's an assistant reference librarian for the Missouri Historical Society. He has been working at the His Historical Society and Research Center for more than 26 years, providing answers to many questions about St. Louis and Missouri history, maybe even some of them twice. Or three times. <laughs> <laughs> like what happened to all the buildings, uh, including the World's Fair, of course. 
When Jason is not at the library, he spends his time volunteering at his church, writing on the blog that he and his wife created, and planning their next road trip or European vacation. With that, I'm going to, going to vacate the seat because the camera is set up here and let Jason uh, tell you about a visit to the World's Fair. Get all set up here. I can actually can hide behind the computer, so that actually is a good change. So, uh, how long do I have had to talk? About an hour? An hour, Mike? Um, yeah, fifty minutes or an hour. Okay. All right. And you're still looking at PowerPoint, not at. Uh, let me try a new share. Where's new share? Is it the drop down right there? Okay, right. new share. Okay, and we want the full screen of PowerPoint. Is it from this one, maybe? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Now the people in Zoom land are seeing the full screen. Good catch, Jeff. Thank you. All right. Yeah. You good to go? Yeah. All right. All right, good, day. good evening, everybody. As Mike said, my name is Jason Stratman, and I thank you for having me here tonight to do this presentation. It is a pleasure and an honor to be speaking to you about the Louisiana Purchase Exposition, which we all know as the 1904 World's Fair. As Mike said, I've been on staff at the Missouri Historical Society for over 26 years. And in case you're wondering, I started when I was five, just out of kindergarten. Okay, I'm, I'm just kidding, I was actually six, but we're not worried about that too much. Uh, my main responsibility at the Historical Society is working in the library, answering reference questions for people who come into the library or they have questions that they email us to, to us. And my job is to find the information for them, make copies of the information that we have in our collection, and just provide them with research strategies, a little bit about what we have available to them. Uh, I will say this at the very beginning of my presentation. I am no way a World's Fair historian or a World's Fair expert. Uh, the information that I have gained through the years about the World's Fair has come from the research on the reference questions that I had been working on. When I started this job 26 years ago, I knew nothing about the 1904 World's Fair. And honestly, I don't think I even knew that there was a World's Fair in St. Louis at the time I started this position. Uh, just through the years of answering people's questions about the fair, little, learning a little bit about this, a little bit about that, answering more and more questions, the more knowledge about the fair that I gained. And about five years ago, it was suggested that I put together a World's Fair presentation. I'm like, okay, I'm not an expert, but I'll do it. And so based off of the knowledge that I've gained through the years, and the research that I have done, this is the presentation that I put together. It's an ever evolving presentation. If you come to this exact same presentation in six months, it's going to be completely different because I'll be taking things out, putting new things in, talking a bit about different topics. Uh, I also would like to uh, point out a very uh, special person who has helped me for over 20 years working in the library. Ray Steiner, who is a member of the World's Fair Society, has been volunteering with us at the Historical Society, along with his wife, Sue, for uh, over 20 years now. And Ray and I have been working closely together on various different types of questions about the fair. Oftentimes, I will get a question, and Ray will help me answer the question. He'll do the research with me. He'll go through the books. He'll go through the materials and help come up with these answers to these questions for the people. So I am deeply indebted to the work that Ray has done through the years with me to help uh, learn more about the World's Fair. So I start off by uh, talking about this quote here. Uh, this is a quote that comes from a guidebook that we have in the library collection. It says, in order to really understand and appreciate the many interests and beauties of the World's Fair, one must spend the entire summer in St. Louis. Now, I don't have the entire summer now to talk to you tonight about the World's Fair. So there are going to be some things about the fair that just are not going to be covered. There's too many uh, wonderful stories, too many complexities to the fair that it cannot be addressed in one single presentation. So the purpose is just to kind of give you an overview and kind of talk to you a little bit about the fair. Now, uh, that being said, my objective is to use the materials found in the Missouri Historical Society collection. I will provide an overview of the World's Fair 
including quotes, newspaper headlines, and tidbits of information that you can use to impress your friends and family with. Uh, now, since this is the World's Fair Society, and this room is filled with many people who probably know more about the fair than I do myself, I have two secondary, uh, two secondary objectives as well. I will attempt to talk about something that you may not be familiar with. There are a lot of aspects of the fair that you are familiar with. My goal is to find at least one thing that you do not know about. It might be difficult, it might be impossible, but I'm gonna try my best. And second of all, I'm gonna give you a little bit of perspective of working with the collections that we have at the Historical Society and how that has shaped my knowledge about the fair and how that has helped me learn so much about the fair. Now, I'm going to start at the very beginning and kind of work my way through and uh, just kind of just be chatting with you about the fair and a little bit about what's going to be available, uh, what we have available to you. Now, at the very end of the presentation, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those questions for you. Now, we have to start at the very beginning about the fair when talking about the fair, thinking back to the fact that the fair was meant to be the 1903 World's Fair in order to celebrate the 100 year anniversary of the Louisiana Purchase, which is the, hence the name the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. It was meant to commemorate the greatest land transaction deal of all time, as one of the guidebooks has said. So it was meant to celebrate the 100 year anniversary of the Louisiana Purchase for the United States. The fair was being planned out and going about it's going about its business of getting it set up. Groundbreaking began on September the 3rd, 1901. I'm sorry, the official construction began September the 3rd, 1901, and the groundbreaking began on December the 20th, 1901. And in this photograph here, we see David R. Francis with the ceremonial shovel getting ready to dig that ceremonial dirt to go along with the ceremonial groundbreaking of the fair. And we can see now a picture of that same shovel, which is in the collection of the Missouri Historical Society. Missouri Historical Society has a large collection of artifacts relating to the fair, and this is just one of those many items that we have in our collection. Now, unfortunately, the fair had to be postponed in 1904. Many of the foreign governments came to the fair officials and said, hey, this is not going to happen in 1903. We just, we just can't do this. Uh, they had committed to uh, the fair being in 1904. Fair. They committed to building the buildings, making everything ready for 1903, but they said that they couldn't do it and that they would endeavor, if the fair was postponed, they would endeavor to surpass even what they did in Chicago and in Paris. So the World's Fair officials decided that in early May of 1902 that the fair would be postponed by an entire year and pushed back to 1904. Now, would the fair in 1904 technically be still the 100 year anniversary of the Louisiana Purchase? Well, technically yes and technically no. Uh, the land transfer of the Louisiana Purchase did not actually happen until 1804 here in St. Louis for what was called the Day of Three Flags on March 9th and 10th of 1804. So technically the fair name of Louisiana Purchase Exposition still was an accurate name for the fair. Now let's talk a little bit about St. Louis in, in 1904. At that time, St. Louis was the fourth largest city in the nation. It had a population of just under 600,000 people. New York was the largest city of the country, Chicago number two and Philadelphia number three. And St. Louis then was number four. And so uh, it was very obvious for St. Louis to be a choice for the World's Fair being such a large city that it was. And going through the collections in our in our library, I, I often find things that are very fascinating that makes me think, hmm. And I found this one book that talks about St. Louis in 1904. And these are some statistics that it has uh, for uh, St. Louis at that time. It had 31 breweries, 481 bakeries, 727 butcher shops, 893 barber shops, 1,242 dressmaking shops, and amazing 1,615 saloons. <laughs> now, my guess that St. Louis people really had their priorities in 1904. Just, just a guess on my part. Now, Mike alluded to this a little bit earlier. 
uh, whenever I give this presentation, I always look to find out events that were happening in St. Louis on that date in 1904, just to kind of give some context of what was happening in the world and, and in St. Louis. The first uh, uh, newspaper clipping that I found here uh, is from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. It is a article that is titled, Russia Moves to Win Support of Great Powers. 1904-1905, Russia was involved in a massive war against Japan. Uh, much of the fighting took place in what is now Northeast China, and naval ships would exchange fire in the waters around the uh, Korean Peninsula. The conflict changed the balance of power in Asia and helped set the stage for World War I and ultimately World War II. The war ended with, I'm sorry, the war ended with Japan winning the war. And some scholars believe that this actually was not the Russian-Japan War. Some of them refer to it as the World War Zero, meaning a lot of the things that happened as a result of this war were precursors to what happened in World War I and in World War II as well. And so if you ever hear that expression, World War Zero, it's referring to the Russian Japanese War of, eight, of 1904 and 1905. Interestingly enough, because of the war, Russia was so consumed of what was happening with the war, they decided not to send an official uh, contingency to St. Louis for the fair. While at the same time, Japan did have a great presence at the fair, which I'll allude to here in a little bit further. Another article that I found in the newspaper was the infamous Weatherbird, uh, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. We all have seen the Weatherbird, I would assume. Well, the Weatherbird is the oldest running cartoon in a newspaper in the United States. It debuted on February the 11th, 1901, and it still continues to this day. And if you're interested, the Weatherbird has its own Twitter feed, and you can follow him on Twitter if you're so inclined to do so. I don't see the interest, but somebody might would want to. Now, uh, the uh, article that you see here is kind of hard to read, so I'm going to read it to you. Uh, it gives the weather forecast for St. Louis for the evening of January the 11th and Tuesday, January 12th. Now, keep in mind, at this time, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch was an evening paper, so the forecast that they were going to be giving was for that night and for the next day. It says snow or sleet tonight and Tuesday, followed by rain and colder weather by Tuesday night, fresh to brisk winds shifting to the northwest by Tuesday, minimum temperatures tonight about 32 degrees. And the words that you see on the uh, the weather bird is holding, he says, ain't this the gloomy day, question mark. Now, the other article that I found was actually in the St. Louis Globe Democrat. And it is referring to the World's Fair. The article title is says, Santos Dumont arrives confident of winning the Brazilian aeronaut, reaches New York on his way to St. Louis, and asserts airships to will soon supplant automobiles. Uh, Santos Dumont was the very famous uh, aviator. He was born in Brazil. He ended up going to Europe and then um, was making his way to St. Louis here in January 1904, just to make sure that everything was set for the balloon races and the air races that were going to be going on at the fair. He was very confident that he was going to win those races. He is quoted in this article as saying, I have received no definite information, but I think the sum will be guaranteed and that I will know by Wednesday. Then I will go to St. Louis. I sincerely hope that the financial arrangements will be made because I will carry back to France with me the purse. So he's very confident that he's going to win this uh, race while in, in St. Louis for the fair. Uh, interestingly enough, in 1902, he comes to St. Louis, meets with fair officials to help plan how the balloon races are going to be held at the fairgrounds. He advises them on how to set up the, the field, how to do everything. Uh, the fair people decide that he knows what he's talking about and accepts his advice. They set aside, set aside 11 acres of land and enclose it with 30 feet high fences to help, help the balloons inflate at a proper uh, way without interfering with, interference with the wind. He comes to St. Louis in June of 1904 for these races. And he's scheduled to give a 
demonstration of his of his balloon on July the 4th. But however, a week before his demonstration was to occur, uh, the bag of his balloon, his dirigible, is slashed and cut, and he's not able to do the demonstration. He sends the bag off back to Paris, hoping it can get fixed. He says, I'll be back in September, and I'll show everybody what's going to happen. Unfortunately, uh, he leaves. He never returns, and he doesn't actually do any kind of demonstrations at the fair itself. So uh there's some speculation that he was sabotaged by other competitors uh i haven't done enough of the research to figure out exactly what uh what the actual story of that is but that's my understanding as it is right now now with so many people coming to st louis they had to have a place to stay and st louis had many many places for them to stay at new health hotels were being built just to accommodate the people coming to St. Louis. One of the guidebooks that we have said that there were 133 hotels, 1,082 rooming houses, 554 boarding houses, and 10 public halls that were available for fairgoers to stay at, which I would imagine was quite a bit of space, but with the number of people that was expected, I, I'm not sure if that would have been enough. There were many companies that were out there that were hoping to help people find places to stay. And one of those places was called the St. Louis World's Fair Accommodation Company. And they would put an advertisement in the paper, says, are you looking for a room? Let us help. And so you could contact this agency and they would help find a hotel room for you or a place for you to stay. Uh, in addition to the hotel rooms, that there were also many houses people would rent out to uh, fairgoers. And uh, those houses were all around St. Louis or all in the park that people could rent out. Uh, one of the things I find to be very fascinating was a uh, quote that we have from Willard B. Shupp from 1975. Uh, Willard uh, attended the fair as a young boy, and his family lived in St. Louis at that time. Uh, he was interviewed by the Missouri Historical Society in 1975, I'm sorry, 1979 for the 75th anniversary of the fair, and he gives this quote in his oral history. He says, my father, like many other families in St. Louis, rented out his home completely furnished to some officials of the fair from foreign from a foreign country and we moved to one of the hotels that sprung up just prior to the opening of the fair so what they did was they completely moved out of their house temporarily stayed in a hotel room and rented out their house to people who were coming into St. Louis for the fair whether it was visitors or foreign dignitaries whoever it may be and I'm supposing that they did this so that they can make us some really quick money and I would think I find this to be very fascinating if someone would actually run out their entire house move out of it and then let somebody else come into their house and stay there while they were in a local hotel but uh from my understanding this was something that was very common by other people as well one of the more famous hotels that sprung up in St. Louis for the fair was what was called the Inside Inn and this was a hotel actually built on inside the fairgrounds it could accommodate up to 4,000 visitors per night and visitors could go and stay at the, this hotel with two different plans one was called the European plan and one was called the American plan and the price varied depending on the plan the European plan was a dollar fifty to five fifty per day while the American plan was three dollars to seven dollars per day and at first I had no idea what this American plan was versus the European plan and based off of the research that I've been able to find and we've been able to uncover the American plan had certain amenities that were added into your hotel state and some of the times they also included your admission into the fairgrounds as well and so it was it cost you a little bit more but you got more out of it as well and uh with 4,000 people, that was just an amazing amount of people to be in this hotel. Uh, there are 3,000 rooms. Uh, it was, looked to be a very massive structure. Now, turning to this next slide, we have this infamous, famous map of the 1904 World's Fairgrounds. Everybody has probably seen this uh, map countless times. It's everywhere. It's the same map that you see in all of the guidebooks, all of the maps, all of the different things that we have in our collection. So this is the standard map that is used to kind of show where the different buildings were located on the fairgrounds. Uh, what's nice about this map is that it's uh, 
has a very detailed legend. So if you're looking for a building, you can find it. And the legend is not actually on the picture you see here, just the actual fairgrounds itself. Uh, the fairgrounds encompass more than 1,200 acres, and which is an amazing feat because it was more than twice the size of the Chicago Fair of 1893. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, St. Louis had, the St. Louis World's Fair was a massive uh, fair. It was by far one of the largest World Fairs that ever occurred in the Victorian era. Does anybody have the exact number of visitors for the fair? I know this group should know the answer to this question, so it shouldn't be a hard answer, hard question to answer. Official attendance for the over 19,000. 19 million. Yeah. 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 Million. The exact number that we have in our bark is 19,694,855 people. Now, to break that down a little bit further, there were paid admissions and there were also free admissions. So the paid admissions were the people who were coming in to visit the fair, and the free admissions were the people who were actually working on the fairgrounds, the, the different buildings and such. They actually had to have a ticket to get into the fair as well, and so that was included with the admission numbers as well. When I give this presentation, I always ask this question to people, and their first response is like, 500,000, a million. And when I tell them 19 million, they're like, no, really? <laughs> Yeah, I said that's the official number that we have for the fair. Now, does anybody know what the date that had the highest admission for, uh, attendance? Anybody want to? Anybody besides Mike that have an answer? For it? Yeah. It was St. Louis Day as well, like September 15th? That's correct. September 15th was the highest recorded attendance of 404,000 people. St. Louis Day was designated as an official holiday in the city of St. Louis, and most of the people were coming to the fair because. They were off. And I think the 404,000 people at the fair on one day, I think the entire city of St. Louis probably was there at that time. Now, does anybody know what the date with the lowest amount of attendance was? This is a trick question, so don't answer too quickly. Lowest date of attendance. Sundays. Anybody but Mike? Karen said Sunday before Mike did. Okay, who did? Oh, yeah, Sunday is the correct answer because the fair was officially closed on Sundays and nobody was in the fairgrounds. There were workers who were there, but there were no uh, official I visitors. I've never heard that question before. So I thought I would just throw that out to you. Now, to get into the fair, you needed a ticket to get in. You had an adult ticket and you had a child's ticket. The child's <laughs> ticket was 25 cents and the adult ticket was 50 cents. And I was like doing this, these presentations, I always kind of like figure out what that would cost in today's money. So there's an inflation calculator that you can go out on the web and search. And 50 cents for an adult ticket would be about $16 in today's money. And that is up until 2023. So that's not old numbers that is based off of 21 or 22 statistics that is including the current rate of inflation as it is today. Uh, and the child's ticket would be just over $8 for that ticket. Now, you had to have a ticket to get on into the fairgrounds but many of the other buildings and the attractions on the fair would require additional tickets. So this was just basically your admission to the fairgrounds was the ticket that you see here. Now, a couple uh, quotes from our oral history collection that we have at the Historical Society. The first one is from Frederick Niemeyer, and he says he remembers going to the fair. And a couple moments ago, I gave you the official count for the fair. Well, I think that might be wrong based off of the following information that I'm going to give you from these uh, quotes. Frederick says this, first we had to obtain entrance. Well, the entrance charge was for our age, 50 cents, or it may have been a dollar. At any rate, that was big money in those days. A friend of mine who became a very prominent businessman showed me an in his ingenuity to me. He said that it was ridiculous to pay that prices to get in, that he knew a place where the pickets on the upright iron gate were opened up by a big husky but we were slender and we could get through. These are his words. It was my contention that we were not really cheating the fair because we spent our money on the fair that we wouldn't have to spend other places by spending it on the admission ticket. I, was, I would think that skipping the fair to, at the gate at the World's Fair was a very fair job on his part. So that's what he, he remembers about going to the fair is squeezing in through the iron gates that some larger husky person had Pride apart. So apparently more people were doing the same thing other than just Frederick and his, his buddy there. 
We also have this uh, recollection from Mrs. Park White, who says this, there were certain days we watched the papers for when the women could get in with their children for free. And we were nasty little cheats as we would fasten ourselves onto the woman bringing a tribe of children in. We weren't rich and they gave us little money to spend on the pike. They didn't have it often. I think it was maybe twice or, or so and our consciousness, consciousness hurt terribly. So basically what she did with her friends is that she just tagged along with other people who were getting into the fair for free when the children were getting in for free that day. People would do anything that they could to save a couple of couple quarters at that time to get into the fair. So I'm going to share a few more uh, ways of getting into the fair. The first item that you see here is a uh, worker's pass that was given to Lu Lucille Coffin Coffinberger who worked as a maid for the Inside Inn. And so this was her pass and that allowed her to get into the fair when she was there to work. Uh, it has her signature on there and everything. And this was her way to get in. There was also what was called the stockholders pass. And this is a uh, set of stockholder passes that we have in our collection. Uh, the stockholder passes were a set of 50 tickets that were sold for $12.50. And it needed to be signed off on and it had to have a signature attached to it. So they couldn't be transferred to one person to another. And the uh, tickets that we have here are for a fairly well-known St. Louis uh, father and son duo. The gentleman on the left, the father is Henry Ware Elliott. He is the president of the St. Louis Hydraulic Press Brick Company. And the young gentleman on the right is Thomas Stearns Elliott. Now, that name may sound familiar to some people, uh, the Elliott family. Uh, the father of Thomas and the grandfather of, of, I'm sorry, the father of Henry and the grandfather of Thomas is William Greenleaf Elliott, who is the founder of Washington University and also the Unitarian Church here in St. Louis. And if you look a little closer at the picture of Thomas Stearns Elliott, we know him today as T.S. Elliott the world famous uh, author who was born and raised here in St. Louis. Now, if you look very closely at their ticket books, uh, T.S. Eliot only had one ticket left on his book while his father had many, many more tickets available. So uh, T.S. Eliot was uh, around high school age at this time. And so he, he made fr frequent visits to the fair. Interestingly enough, we also had a stockholder pass for Lucille Koffenberger in our collection as well. So when Lucille was not working as a maid at the inn, she was coming back to the fair as a visitor herself. And I was always interested to know a little bit more about Lucille and what, what was her story, since it's not a name people are very familiar with. And this is one of the things that Ray had helped me with doing some research. We were able to determine that she lived at 4306 North Broadway, possibly with her son, Charles. Uh, she's listed in a directory in 1901 as a widow of William. And that is the only year that we are able to find her in the directory or any information about her from the directory. Uh, there is an article from 1902 about her. Uh, there is a fire that she witnesses at a home. She runs into the home and alerts the family that the house is on fire. The family escapes unharmed, but she is badly injured in the fire herself. She survives and is well enough to actually work at the fairgrounds as a maid. But after that, there is no more information that can be found on her initially. I, I'm still interested in finding to see if there's anything that new that could be found about her. If she stay, stayed in St. Louis, did she remarry? What her story was. But I think it'd be very fascinating that she actually saved the lives of a family. And she you know, was a, a, a visitor to the fair and she also worked at the fair itself. Now, in addition to the many, many millions of people who came to the fair, also some many foreign dignitaries came and US presidents came to the fair as well. We all know that President Theodore Roosevelt was at the fair. He, in this picture here, we see him uh, with his wife, Edith and David R. Francis on what was called Roosevelt Day. It was November the 26th and there was a ceremony in his honor. We also have a, a oral history in our collection that remembers Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, the memory comes to us from Julia Davis, and she says this, the president of the U.S. visited the fair. Well, you could see all of the little school children all lined up there. The carriage stopped just about where my gang was. 
we were all mixed, colored and white. It didn't make a difference. You don't have to be fussing. We didn't, I'm sorry, you don't have to be fussing and fighting. We were busy looking. They just couldn't. It was all about the people of the world. It was all about of the people of the world there too. They were all one. I truly believe that it was the World's Fair and we just saw people. The carriage stopped right in front of where we were. I touched the carriage. Oh, it was the greatest thing. Theodore Roosevelt, my lands, I do, I do remember that. He just passed on by. Now I can't say for certain if Julia Davis saw him on the Roosevelt Day or another visit to the fair or something. Uh, the, the oral history does not go into detail about when she was there seeing him. She would have been about 12 years old at that time. And Julie Davis may be a name that you are familiar with. Uh, for more than 50, almost 50 years, she worked as a teacher in the St. Louis public school system. And she was an active collector and writer of African-American history. When she retired from teaching in 1961, she created a fund to purchase African-American documents for the St. Louis Public Library. Her personal collection and the items that were published, I'm sorry, that were published, purchased by the public library were then and kept by the Julia Davis branch of the St. Louis Public Library system. Julia Davis is the first living person to have a branch of the St. Louis Public Library named after her. So it's an amazing feat in itself. Now we all are should be familiar with the Chinese prince Hulan. Now, for whatever reason, I try to mix his name up. I try to call him Lupin. So if I do say his name wrong, please forgive me. Uh, he was the uh, heir to the Chinese throne in 1904, and he would visit St. Louis for the fair. But did you know that the prince was a big fan of ragtime music? Okay, I, I, I tell you a little bit more about that. Now, he comes to the fair in Mar uh, May of 1904. He stays in a downtown hotel, Washington Hotel, in a beautiful large uh, apartment that is at the hotel. When he comes to St. Louis, heavy rains are going on all around St. Louis, and he doesn't get a chance to get to the fair like he wants to. So he's forced to stay in his, ho in his hotel, his apartment at the hotel. Now, also related to the story is a gentleman by the name of, uh, what was his name? William Kunkel. William Kunkel was a pianist, a piano player, and a major famous composer here in St. Louis. And he writes a musical piece in honor of the Chinese prince. He hands it off to the Chinese delegation. The Chinese delegation gets it to the prince. The prince is very impressed by the music and invites Kunkel to his apartment for an opportunity to play this piece for him. Now, Kunkel and his wife appear at the hotel, at the apartment at the hotel. They're getting ready to do the, the performance of the piece. They realize that the piano that he has in his apartment, yes, he has an apartment with a piano in it. It's a playing, uh, self-playing piano, and he can't play it himself. So he the Chinese delegation that is there has to get the hotel staff to get some tools and equipment to disengage the playing piano so that it can be played manually. Well, while they're waiting, the prince decides, well, he's not going to wait. He goes into the other room, he pulls out his own toolkit, drops to the floor, pulls Kunkel down with him, and they fix the piano to where it's not being a self-playing piano. <laughs> Kunkel hops back up, plays the piece for the prince, and he also tells him that he wants to perform for him some additional pieces, some ragtime pieces. And so Kunkel then plays two or three other additional pieces of the ragtime persuasion. And the concert lasts for over three hours in the hotel apartment. And at the end of the concert, the prince grabs Kunkel by the hands and tells him through the help of an interpreter that he really enjoys music and that he really had never witnessed any marvelous playing as that before. And so he was very taken by the fact that he had played first the piece that was created for him, but then also the ragtime music as well. 
So he had been well versed in music from all over the world, but he was very impressed by the ragtime music. Now, as a way to thank Kunkel for coming and doing the performance of the concert, he suggests to Kunkel's wife, take any, anything that you want out of my apartment as a thank you. His wife grabs, excuse me, sorry. His wife grabs two vases and the prince presents them to Kunkel and his wife and says this, they are the most beautiful that I have ever seen. And the article indicates that the vases would be valued at over $2,000 at that time, which today would be in just regular money, it would be about $67,000. But I would suppose that if you were a collector of World's Fair memorabilia, you might be willing to pay more than that $67,000 for that. Jerry? I don't have it. Darn. <laughs> yeah, it's, now, interesting side note to this story. Uh, there was a gentleman who had inquired to the library last year about vases that were given to his aunt by a Chinese dignitary. And through the research, this is how I found this article. I'm thinking, okay, he said his great aunt was a music student and had came to the fair and had acquired two vases that were somehow given to her at the fair. And then when his great aunt passed away, he acquired them in his, in his personal possession. So I'm thinking, I found this article. It's about Chinese vases and this guy has Chinese vases. This has got to be the story because Kunkel was also a music teacher as well. And so maybe he taught this great aunt and then he gave the vases to the great aunt. And then, but it turns out that they weren't Chinese vases. They were actually Japanese vases. And so, so unfortunately, this is a great story, but it doesn't connect with this guy who has these vases. And I was devastated because I thought I had really found something great and wonderful. And but still, it's still great and wonderful, but just not for him. But so, right now, if you were getting going to the fair, there was multiple different ways of getting around the fairgrounds, and one of them was the intermural railroad that took you from the Lindell entrance and wove its way around the fairgrounds through seventeen different stops that you can get off on. Uh, one of the things that I find very fascinating about this uh, stop number thirteen, station number thirteen, uh, was near the mining and the uh, the mining camps and the mining exhibitions. And at that time, there was some very superstitious miners that were there at the fair and they fought vigorously to get the station 13 name changed to 12 and a half because they were too superstitious to be having, being so close to station 13. Now, August the 31st was Mining Gulch Day. And from the research that we've been able to find, the station was temporarily changed to 12 and a half to go along with Mining Gulch Day, but there was never any official designation that it was going to change. And the research says nothing, the newspaper searching shows nothing that ever became of officially changing the name to 12 and a half. Now, there's also other ways of getting around the fairgrounds. We have these uh, roller chairs and these automobiles. If you were so inclined, you could hire a tour guide to take you around the fairgrounds in one of these roller carts and just wheel you around the different places the, of the of the fairgrounds. They would charge uh, 60 cents for a guided tour per hour or 35 cents per hour without a guide. So if you wanted to just kind of wheel yourself through the fairgrounds, you could do it for 35 cents an hour, but you had to pay a $5 deposit fee to make sure that you would bring the, the, the chair back, which in a lot of respects is what they do today. Uh, we also see the automobile here, which is more kind of like a, like a standing bus. There was a chauffeur who would drive the, the, the automobile and just take you around the fairgrounds. Uh, they could seat up to 40 people at a time, which I don't think would have been too safe, but also at the same time, I don't think they were going too fast. So I don't think it would have been too big of a, of a risk factor at that time. In the collections of the Missouri Historical Society, we have many wonderful journals, diaries, and letters that were written about the fair. And one of my favorite ones of the diaries that we have is by a guy, his name is Edward D. P. Schneiderhan. He's of German heritage, so I like to say his name, Schneiderhan. So if I'd say that, just 
kind of go along with me on that one. Uh, he visited the fair on many occasions, uh, and he kept a very detailed diary uh, of his experiences at the fair. His diary actually dates back to 1890 and goes all the way through 1913. So his time of talking about the fair is just one small facet of his entire uh, writing scheme. Uh, he is, of, like I said, of German heritage. He is an attorney here in St. Louis. And he also works as a legal advisor for Cardinal Glennon and Archbishop Joseph Ritter. He writes in his diaries very much about things that are of interest to him. His, he's very interested in, in politics. He's very interested in his Catholic faith, anything that has to do with German and German activities here in St. Louis. And so it was very wonderful to be able to see uh, his descriptions of the fair just because it was just so eloquently written. And a couple of quotes that we have from him uh, that I pulled out. The first one, the picture of the fair was a revelation. It is a beautiful, its beauty indescribable. The second, the multiplicity of beautiful views was astonishing. And it was scarcely believable that the, any beholder could see these unforgettable beauties, beautiful scenes without the deepest emotion. He writes just these really eloquent, detailed, in many occasions, depictions of his visits to the fair. And since he was of German heritage, and I thought maybe, you know, he would have went to German Day at the fair, which was on August, I'm sorry, October the 6th, since being a German in German Day would be a big thing for him to write about. Well, in his diary for August, let's see, October the 6th, he says, went to the fair for German Day. <laughs> nothing else, nothing more, just went to the fair for German Day. I was so utterly disappointed because I gave this presentation back a few years ago to a, a German heritage group in St. Charles. And I thought this would be an awesome and wonderful thing to talk about. And he just kind of just skipped it all together. He does talk about the German exhibits in the different buildings and such on different general entries, but he doesn't talk anything about German Day. I guess it wasn't impressive to him, I guess. So. Now, going to the fairgrounds meant you had various different options available for you to look at, things to look at. The palaces were one of the major things that were available to you. The Palace of Fine Arts uh, is one of the 13 palaces that were created on the fairgrounds. This one was built as a permanent structure that would then be turned over to the city of St. Louis after the fair was over to become the St. Louis Art Museum that we know today. Now, the Palace of Transportation was another one of those places that you could go to visit. Uh, the fair had many different items on display, including things within these palaces. So you could go and visit in, in the Palace of Fine Arts. You could visit paintings and artworks and sculptures and all different types of artwork. In the Transport Transportation Palace, you could find railroad cars. You could find horse and buggies. You could find locomotives, all different kinds of things that were related to transportation. And this is where they would put the items on display and they would be judged and juried by a group of individuals for different criteria to see if they would win a prize. And this is probably one of the most researched topics that we have at the Historical Society. They gave out a grand prize, a gold medal, silver medal, and a bronze medal. And many times we get people coming into the library or writing to us saying, I've got the grand prize from the World's Fair. Can you help verify this for me? Well, then I have to break them the news that there were multiple grand prizes from multiple different categories than that there were hundreds of different gold medals and silver medals and bronze medals. And they're kind of just got this really disappointed look on their face because they think that they have this one of a kind piece that nobody else has and that they're the only one that has a grand prize from the fair. But when they realize that they're remote, they're still kind of excited, but just not as not as, as interested in it. Uh, this is a question that we get so many times. And through the years, the technology and the resources that we have available has made this question a lot easier to answer. Uh, we have resources available that help us kind of pinpoint where we can find these things. But oftentimes someone says, hey, I've got this thing that was at the fair. Can you prove it for me? Well, you know, there's thousands of buildings and possibly millions of things that were on display, not just in the different palaces, but in the individual buildings and all that stuff. And so a lot of times those questions are not easily answered because the information just doesn't exist you know someone says well this was on display at the you know the german building well the german building didn't have an itemized inventory of everything that was on display so unfortunately unless there's a picture that shows that item on display 
we were not able to really answer that question for the person. So, you know, there's good speculation that it might be from the fair, but, you know, not, we don't always have a, a, a good answer to that person's question. In addition to the mini palaces that were there, there were also uh, the different state buildings as well on the plateau of states. Uh, the picture that we see here is of the Missouri building. And the Missouri building was the probably the most impressive building of, of the state buildings because it was the Missouri building. And it had to be because it had to show off Missouri in its grandest and most grandiose form. And so uh, unfortunately, the Missouri building caught on fire just before the fire ended and burned to, to the ground and was completely destroyed. Uh, many people think that this building still exists in some capacity, but unfortunately, at the break of tomb, that no, it does not. And the site of the Missouri building is the site of the uh, World's Fair Pavilion today. And so there's also a good big group of people that think the World's Fair Pavilion was built for the fair, but it was actually built after the fair. So one of my jobs is, is kind of debunking a lot of those urban myths and urban legends that have to do with the fair. And uh, the World's Fair Pavilion is one of those buildings. Oklahoma Territory Pavilion was one of the buildings that was at the fair. Uh, many of the states and uh, territories at that time would build uh, buildings on the fair site that would be indicative of their home state. They would kind of show off a little bit more about their state. Uh, for example, the Virginia building was built after Monticello, and the Kentucky building was built kind of to look like a southern plantation style antebellum house. Now, the Oklahoma building here we see uh, celebrated Oklahoma history as it was just kind of just in its infancy, just as a territory. Uh, September the 6th was designated as Oklahoma, as Oklahoma Day, and it had 2,000 watermelons cut and served to visitors on the front lawn of the building. Now, after the fair was over with, this building was then sold uh, for $2,000, and it was deconstructed and gotten rid of but it didn't get wasn't gotten rid of altogether it actually then became the elks lodge in el reno oklahoma and this is a google shot of that building as it looks today uh if you didn't know any better you would think that was just a weird looking odd looking old building but when you see it side by side to the original building at the fairgrounds you can definitely see that it is the same building there is some modifications to it, but it, in fact, is the same building. It was literally deconstructed piece by piece and sent to Oklahoma and then reconstructed in El Reno, Oklahoma. There were many, uh, also many foreign buildings that were at the fairgrounds. And a lot of times these buildings also were built in the style or the heritage of the country of origin. For example, the Japanese pavilion, the Japanese land was built to look like traditional Japanese structures. It had, a, let's see, I'm sorry, the, the structures were built to look like traditional Japanese style homes and geisha houses and other buildings as well. There were dances of Japanese dancers on the site and different events were held there. Now, the other building that you see here is the Australian Pavilion. Now, this caused quite the controversy at the fair. You may not have realized it, but many people didn't like the Austrian Pavilion because it was not traditional Austrian architecture. It was more Art Nouveau, and that was not the traditional Austrian architecture. Uh, and many people were just really, really upset by that fact. But on the flip side, the Department of Art awarded Austria a special gold medal that said that they had the best, most complete, and most attractive installation of any of the buildings of the foreign buildings on the site. So somebody did like the building, maybe not the architecture of the building, but they liked the contents of the building itself. Now, another one of those foreign buildings that I like to talk about is the Swedish Pavilion. The Swedish Pavilion was constructed in Sweden from native Swedish materials, completely constructed in Sweden, deconstructed, shipped to the United States, transported to St. Louis, and then reconstructed on the fairgrounds as it was made in Sweden. Now, interestingly enough, this is another one of those buildings that was then deconstructed and moved to another location. In 1905, it was sold to the Minister of Sweden and Norway, the Honorable W. W. Thomas, he purchased the building and transported it to Lindsborg, Kansas. But why Lindsborg, Kansas? Well, 
In 1869, Lindsborg, Kansas was established by a group of immigrants from a small province in Sweden. And so they had a very large Swedish population. The town is in the central part of Kansas, just kind of south of the Salina, Kansas. If you're familiar with the Kansas geography, the town today has a population of, of about 4,000 people. And many of the people who still live there today are of uh, Swedish descent. Originally, the building was taken to Lindsborg, Kansas and used at Bethany College as part of the college, um, one of the buildings on the college. It then was transferred to what was called Heritage Square, and it's now a museum in the, in the city itself. And in 1976, it was rededicated by the King of Sweden coming to Kansas for that event. Now, one of the more unfortunate aspects of the fair was what we called uh, the world on display. Uh, when people of different countries were brought into St. Louis to be uh, on display for other people from other parts of the world to observe and see how they were living. Uh, these people ranged from Native American people to indigenous people of Japan and the Philippines. And it was an opportunity for the, as they would say, the more advanced civilizations to see how other people of the world were living at that time. Uh, the picture that we see here is of the Igorot tribe. Uh, they're getting ready to prepare their dinner, and you can see the people kind of hovering around them. Uh, we have a quote here from Frederick Niemeyer again. He says, I didn't see them kill a dog, but I saw them cook a dog and eat it, even though they ate it right off the fire. It's not to be confused with our hot dog. <laughs> so uh, the Igorot tribe was known to have escaped out of their tribe and go into the surrounding area and steal dogs and bring them back to the uh, to the fairgrounds. The urban legend says that the name Dogtown was named after the Igorots uh, because that neighborhood, and that community would have been where the close to where the Igorots were staying. However, the name Dogtown was actually used as early as 1890s and did not it predates the fair, and so it was not a name given to the area because of the World's Fair. Another way that this these displays were called the exhibit of strange people. In the collection of the Missouri Historical Society, we have a collection of uh, not really a diary, not really a journal. We are calling it a chronicle, and these are chronicles from Adele Finite Phelps. Adele was uh, about mm, 13, 14 years old at the time, 15 years old at the time of the fair. And she visited the fair on many occasions. Uh, her, her father actually attended the dedication day of the fair. And her, her father then would go back to witness the construction of the fair many times. Uh, and it is on record to have, she's on record of attending the fair about 90 times while it was open. And we think, she put together this chronicle as a school project later uh, for uh, a project because she goes back into great detail about visiting the fair and talking about different aspects of the fair, but it's written not as necessarily as a remembrance, but more as like a more of a historical piece. Uh, she also went to the uh, people on display exhibits and she actually had one of the Igorot um, people, his name was Antonio, to draw a picture of himself for her, for her uh, diary or her her sketchbook, and so he did this portrait of himself and gave it to her, and he actually signed his name on that page as well. Now we also, she also was able to get the autograph of Geronimo, and that's also included within her 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 chronicle. Now this chronicle was just given to the Historical Society in 2020, and I am just now getting a chance to go through it and learn more about what's in it. Fortunately, it has been digitized in its entirety and is available on our website for you to view. So if you're interested in, in looking at it, it is all there for you to look at, as well as the Schneiderhan diary as that I mentioned earlier as well. Now the pike is one of the other aspects of the fair that I like to talk about. And the pike is kind of more the entertainment aspect of the fair, the part of the fair that the fair organizers weren't so keen on initially, but they figured that they needed to have something like this so that you could kind of draw in more people to the fair and kind of make more opportunity to make more money for the fair. And so this was an opportunity to see all different kinds of things at the fair. It included uh, baby incubators, a uh, area called creation where you could actually go through on a 
on a boat looking at different biblical stories of the story of creation. And the infamous Jim Key was there as well. The 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 learned horse, I guess is the name that was given to him. He could actually uh do arithmetic, he could tell letters, and he could actually, according to the information I found, he could actually even tell Bible verses that included horses. So he was actually trained by a former enslaved gentleman by the name of William Key. And uh, William Key says that he never whipped the horse, Jim Key. He only trained him with patience and kindness. Uh, the image that you see here at the very top of the screen that's coming in now is a coupon book that you could use that would be uh, allow you to get discounts for different admissions to the pike. This uh, particular coupon book came from the Palace of Liberal Arts and was good for only the day that the coupon book was given out. So this particular coupon book was dated August the 27th. So you could actually get discounted admission tickets to the, the various different aspects of the pike itself. The Tyrolean Alps was one of the bigger aspects of the pike. And if you didn't know any better, you would thought you were strolling through a large German uh, snow-capped mountain side because the, the way it was constructed, the mountains were just very kind of built into the background of the different buildings to make you think that you were in Germany at that time. On the Tyrolean Alps was a restaurant that could house up to 5,000 people at one time. And this is a uh, menu from that restaurant called the Luchau Faust Restaurant. And we have, I think, five or six of these menus in our collection, and they are dated with a very specific date. So you could each day they would publish a new and improved menu for the uh, for the restaurant. And these are a couple of things that you could have purchased while at the restaurant. Under the heading of cold dishes, there's various different items, including beef tongue. And also under the heading of sandwiches, there was also another one for beef tongue. I'm not really sure what the difference between a cold sandwich of beef tongue it was versus the sandwich of a beef tongue. I would imagine it was probably warmed up, maybe. I just not really sure exactly. <laughs> and also at the very bottom of the screen, you see uh, some dr draft beer that was being sold by the restaurant. And you see on the on the menu there is Anheuser Busch, Falstaff, Columbia Beer, Green Tree and Wainwright beer, which are very much staples of St. Louis breweries at that time. Now, if German culture and German cuisine was not your forte, maybe you could go over to the Fair Japan uh, area and take part in the, the Japanese uh, culture and, and food. There actually is a Fair Japan restaurant that had a full-scale menu of different items available. You could purchase soups, fish, different entrees, vegetables, and on the very uh, right-hand side is special Japanese dinners that you could purchase. And at the very bottom, they have regular Japanese dinner with sake or without sake, if you were so inclined. So while this menu is for the Fair Japan restaurant, most of the items on the menu itself were not Japanese-related food. They were more what I call more American Americanized food entrees. Now, the famous observation wheel, which uh, probably was one of the things that has the most last, lasting legacies of the 1904 World's Fair, the Ferris wheel. And uh, the Ferris wheel is one of the topics that has very many urban legends attached to it. I often have to talk to people about what happened to the Ferris wheel, what's going on with the Ferris wheel. And when I first started working at this job, the big push was to dig up Skinker Boulevard because at that time there was thought that the Ferris wheel axle was buried under Skinker and that this was the only way that we're going to prove it was to basically dig up part of Forest Park and part of Skinker. Fortunately, that never happened. So uh, that urban legend has been kind of laid to rest, so to speak, has been buried, for lack of a better word, hopefully. Uh, what I find it very fascinating about the Ferris wheel is that you could actually get married if you were so inclined on the Ferris wheel. The Ferris wheel admission ticket will allow you for two complete revolutions around on the Ferris wheel. And so that was a long enough time of about 15 or 20 minutes or so for you to get married. So you can bring your chaplain in, you bring your, uh, your bride, your groom, your witnesses, and you could have your ceremony while getting married 
on the Ferris wheel. Now here are a couple quotes from Edwin uh, Philibet, who has a, a journal in our library at the collection of the Historical Society. He says, the view from the top of the wheel was very fine. We made two trips in the afternoon and the evening two more to see the illumination, which looked fine. So I'm guessing he thought it would look very fine, but from my opinion. So this was an opportunity for people to go up and see things from a viewpoint that they probably had never witnessed before because it was such high up off, off of the ground. The other aspect of the 1904 World's Fair is the infamous 1904 Olympics, which were held in St. Louis and the first time that the Olympic Games were held in the United States. And I always like to tell the story that the Olympics were stolen, forced away or bribed away from Chicago. Now, the story goes that Chicago was planning to have the Olympic Games in 1904. St. Louis was planning the World's Fair. St. Louis officials were talking to the Olympic officials saying, hey, we're having these all these great big World's Fair in St. Louis. No one's going to be coming to Chicago for the for the Olympics. You might want to bring in the St. Louis. And so either they convinced them, stronghold them, bribe them. I don't know exactly what, but they convinced them to move the fair to the Olympics from Chicago to St. Louis for the for the fair. And still to this day, Chicago has yet to hold the Olympics. So it's one thing that we can talk about in respects to Chicago. They lost out in 2012 to London. They still haven't held the Olympics. I don't know if they're ever going to get it, but St. Louis still has a claim to fame as being the first Olympic, first American city to host the Olympics. Now, the Olympics is very widely talked about in many other different uh, arenas. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. I just want to point on a couple people who were uh, at the Olympics. First gentleman on the left hand side is a gentleman by the name of George Pogue. George Pogue is the first African American to compete in the Olympics and the first African American to uh, win a medal at the Olympics. He is the third gentleman on the right. It's kind of hard to see because the first guy is actually cut off, so he is the gentleman right here. Uh, Interestingly enough, George Polk stays in St. Louis after the fair and becomes a teacher at Sumner High School. And he stays there for about 10 years. And he kind of leaves in secrecy in the mid 19 teens. And there's uh, some speculation about why he left. And I'm not going to go into why because it's not been proven one way or the other. And I don't want to speculate about it. Uh, but he leaves uh, St. Louis and he goes back to uh milwaukee where he came from initially and he actually then uh, uh dies in chicago in do i have the date no i do not have the, in 1960 he dies in chicago now we also we all probably know about mr hicks the infamous marathon runner who decided that he was going to cheat in order to win the olympic marathon so i'm not going into a lot of detail about him because He's over talking. He's not really worth talking about because he's just, in my opinion, a very big cheat. But I wanted to put his picture there just because he would use a combination of strychnine, egg whites, and brandy to demonstrate that the use of chemistry would help greatly improve your ability to run a marathon. My opinion is, was how was he able to even run a marathon with all of that going on at the same time? I just, just not really sure. And then also the anthropological days were part, not really a part of the Olympics, but kind of are considered to be a part of the Olympics and uh, was where when many Native American tribes were competing against each other uh, as far as uh, trying to compete against each other in competitions that they were not even skilled in doing. Now, there's many documentations about all of the world, the Olympic athletes that were in St. Louis, but have we ever heard of the Olympic medal winner M.G. Hammond. That's because he's not really an Olympic competitor, but in my opinion, he probably should have been. He probably could have been. Uh, even if they didn't want to have him as part of the Olympics, he probably should want a medal anyway for the most unusual way to get to St. Louis for the fair. He lives in San Francisco. He leaves San Francisco and let me get my notes here. Excuse me. He leaves in San Francisco in leaves San Francisco March the 19th, but doesn't get to St. Louis until August the 1st, 135 days later. 
how does he get to St. Louis? He walked to St. Louis. So he wins the medal for the most endurance minded person to get to the fair. He leaves San Francisco, comes down to Los Angeles, over to Albuquerque, up and over to Kansas City, and then into St. Louis 135 days later. Somewhere along the way, he acquires a team of, of mules, and another gentleman joins him for the journey. He walks the entire way from San Francisco to St. Louis, which is an interesting thing all in itself. Now, Jason, two yeah. minutes. How many? Two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I got to talk about the cone kids real quick. Here. Now, I'm not going to touch about, about the, the food at the fair a lot because we all know about the foods that were invented or popularized at the fair. Many people think that the fair had all these great, wonderful foods that were invented at the fair, but in actuality, most of them were not invented at the fair. The only two that were actually kind of technically invented for the fair were puffed rice and fairy floss. And we know fairy floss today as cotton candy. Now, what's kind of funny about cotton candy it was that it was actually invented by a dentist who, in my opinion, was not really interested in making cotton candy as enjoyable for the kids, per se. He was looking at making cotton candy to drum up business for his, his dentistry. I could be wrong. That's just a speculation on that. I, I, I had no way of proving that fact. Now, a couple of little bits of tidbits of information for you that you may or may not know about the fair. For the first time, the Liberty Bell is west of the Mississippi and is exhibited in the Pennsylvania building at the fair. We may have already known that. We also may have already known that the Palace of Ar Agriculture had a walnut elephant statue, a pecan horse statue, a prune bear statue, and several other butter sculptures. Festival Hall had a dome that was larger than St. Peter's Basilica and it had the largest pipe organ of over 10,000 pipes and had an auditorium for 3,500 people. Sorry. Now, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, this final item, I know nobody knows this in this room. <laughs> and if when I tell you this, if you want to revoke my membership to the World's First Society, even though I don't have one, please, I, I would not be devastated. But in the 26 years that I have studied the World's Fair in many different aspects, I have never ever seen the musical Meet Me in St. Louis. Oh, no. oh. I know it's devastating. <laughs> uh, I know. That's good. So, uh, and I leave you with this final slide from uh, with a quote from Edward uh, Schneiderhan says, "Never to expect to see anything so grand again." And this image here is from uh, the farewell day of the fair, which is having fireworks display. Uh, at the fairgrounds. And if you look very closely, those fireworks that's in the face of a shape is actually looks, to me, it looks like David R. Francis's face, which I assume it is. So uh, that does conclude my presentation. If you are more interested in learning more about the fair, uh, coming to come to the library to do research for the fair, uh, we are currently closed for renovations, but hope to reopen in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're hoping to open in January at the end of January, early February, but the official date has not yet been set. We're thinking probably late January, early February, but uh, you can always email me or call me. I have left my card over here at the count, uh, corner of this table. I also have some brochures for the Historical Society. And as Mike alluded to earlier, we are reopening a new and improved World's Fair exhibit in 2024. The current one will be closing after only eight no, April 30th. It's been open for about 19 years now, yeah. give or take. But we hope to reopen with a brand new interpretation, a new uh, look at the World's Fair and many stories from the fair. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I'll stick around for a little bit. So, we have to wait. Okay. So, there's one question online mm -hmm. from Jenny. We're going to alternate questions from online and in the room, online and in the room for about three or four minutes. We also have to do the attendance prize drawing. And Jason, you get to draw names okay. for that. And I have a presentation to make to you about that. All right. And et cetera. He's wondering if you learned anything while studying the festival hall about the gold leaf that was on the dome, if there was any trace of that. To be honest with you, no. 
not that I don't know anything about it because I don't know anything about it. And I, I'll probably admit that my job at the historical society is to do research. So I can definitely look into something like that. That's something I could do some research, uh, go through the collections, go through the catalogs and help answer the questions. I can't just spout off information like that. If I don't have the answer, I can always ask Ray too, so. Okay, next, Aaron. My question is about the pipe. Could you go to the pipe without going into the fair? And no? No. And so it wasn't open at all, except when the fair was open? Correct. Wow. Hmm. It was open later than the palaces. Okay. I hope you don't mind me jumping Ooh, in. Right ahead. That's a short okay. word. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. They all had their own, like, they had, they had the main admission ticket and then individual tickets for the individual attractions on the bike. So, thank you. Yeah. Uh, another person is asking if the fair had its own police force and how large was it? Yes, there was what was called the Jefferson Guard. Uh, and there's also a police substation that was set up on the fairgrounds. I don't know the exact number of. of Assigned. Yeah, there, there, there were, there is some documentation that shows that. In our collections, I just have not looked at the exact number to that. I, I can speak and say that the um, the police force in St. Louis was divided in half during the fair. Half the police force was on fairgrounds, and the other half had the entire city to look at. Okay. Question from the audience. I don't see any hands. Doug, you got another one. How soon after the fair did the zoo open? Uh, it dates, the, actually the zoo was already opened. There was actually a zoological park in St. Louis prior to the 1904 World's Fair. It was at Fairground, Fairground Park. And after the fair was over with the land, was they got the land in Forest Park. And I believe like 1914, maybe? Yeah, the zoological society i think was established in 08 or 09 they started with the bird cage built some things around that and formally established the zoo i think in 1913 more or less mm -hmm. plus or minus a year yeah. mm -hmm. another one judge real quick no nope, that's it okay um i have a very special announcement before we get to attendance prizes and stuff like that um two announcements 